morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce our today's condensed matter seminar speaker, Frank Pullman. Um, Frank um, comes to us virtually from um, Technical University uh, in Munich, Germany. Um, a few words about Frank's uh, bio. Um, he did his PhD at the Institute of uh, Complex Systems. It's a Max Planck, one of the Max Planck Institutes in Dresden, uh, which he got in 2006. And for that work, he received the coveted Otto Hahn Medal. It's a medal that's awarded by the Max Planck Society to the outstanding doctoral students every year. Um, he then um, went to do a postdoc um, at Berkeley, UC Berkeley, working with Joe Moore. Um, and afterwards, uh, since 2011, he became uh, a research group leader at uh, MPI, uh, at Max Planck Institute in Dresden, the same way he got his PhD, as, as I understood. Um, uh, it was during that period that he received the Walter Schottke Prize of the German Physical Society. And then a year later, in 2016, uh, Frank joined the uh, professor's rank at uh, the Technical University in Munich. Um, Frank is well known for his uh, diverse work on many fronts. Um, I don't know if I could even say what the uniting theme was. I would say accurate numerical simulations using classical computers, but the title of today's talk says that it's not just that, it's also <laughs> quantum quantum processes. So without further ado, um, let's welcome Frank Pullman and please Frank, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks Andre for the very kind introduction and for inviting me to this seminar talk. So as, as pointed out, I, I want to discuss some ideas about how we can use um, quantum computers for simulating problems that are relevant in, in condensed matter physics. And the work that I'm talking today has been done together with a bunch of people from Munich, so including Leo, who is a PhD student in my group, Bernard, who is a master student, Adam Smith, who was a postdoc in my group and then moved to Nottingham, uh, and my colleague Michael Knapp, and also together with Andrew Green from London, Christina Knapp from Microsoft, and uh, Kevin and Petram from Google. So these are the, the main contributors to, to the works that I'm, I'm talking about. So I'm going to talk about two separate ideas, so like some projects related on, in, on this, this topic. But before getting there, I want to just briefly motivate what I'm, what I'm working on. So, and the specific problem that I want to use quantum computers for is to learn about different phases of matter. So and let me just introduce this concept of phases of matter and discuss this a bit more broadly. So we are all very familiar with this concept that substances around us can occur in different phases. So for example, we have liquid water and we have water ice. And in the difference between those two phases is that the water ice spontaneously breaks the continuous rotation and translation symmetry of space. And then we can use this spontaneous symmetry breaking as means to, to classify different phases in, in terms of their, their symmetry. Over the past couple of decades, it became clear that there are a lot of different phases that fall outside of this scheme that allows us to classify phases in terms of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And here I just give a list of the different phases that, that can occur. Certainly not a complete list, but just giving you some example. And I want to just point out that there are different classes of phases, right? So first of all, we have this distinction between trivially disordered and symmetry broken phases. So, so this is what I talked about before. So trivially disordered would be water, liquid water, and symmetry broken would be um, ice. But now there are these different classes of what's commonly referred to as topological phases. These are well-defined phases of matter. I just can describe in a moment what I mean by a well-defined phase of matter. So we have these phases of matter and they are characterized by, by certain uh, properties. And the different phases that I want to distinguish are the one hand uh, symmetry protected topological phases. These are 
phases of matter that require certain symmetries to be well-defined, but yet these phases don't break those symmetries, right? So it's different from symmetry broken where we require symmetries, but then these symmetries are spontaneously broken. Here we have a case where symmetries are really important, but yet they're not spontaneously broken. Then there's another class which we call topologically ordered phases, and those do not require any symmetry, right? So even if we just perturb the system with whatever local term, these phases are robust and, and well-defined. And a third class that I list here are so-called fracton phases, which are yet a bit different. So they are in a way sharing many similarities with the topologically ordered phases, but they're yet intrinsically different from, from those. So, so this gives us a big zoo of, of phases of matter. And for many of them, they only occur in strongly interacting quantum problems. And those are intrinsically hard um, to, to simulate, for example, on classical computers. And, and this brings me to what I want to discuss in this talk. I want to discuss some ideas how we can use so-called noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. So these are the quantum computers that are currently available and will be kind of improved over the next couple of years. And then how we can use these machines for simulating uh, these topological phases of matter. Let me a bit more precise about the mission that we are on. So, so specific questions that we that we might have is that we might have a specific Hamiltonian, uh, and then we might be interested in the ground state of that Hamiltonian, and that ground state of this Hamiltonian might have some interesting topological properties, right? So, so and if if we have a generic Hamiltonian and we want to learn about the properties of the ground state, this is generically um, a task that grows exponentially with system size. Just to make this a bit more specific, if we take a fairly simple model where we just have, say, um, um, spin one half particles localized on a site, uh, on a on lattice like this Kagome lattice, for example, and we want to find the ground state, then even like using the biggest computers available to us, we can only do this for the order of 40 or so spins or equivalently qubits. However, current days or currently available quantum computers already have the order of 50 qubits, which goes beyond what's doable on the largest computers available. But there are other big question marks. And even though these machines do have a rather large number of qubits, so larger on what we can simulate with current day quantum computers, it's, it's not as clear how, how well we can use them. Right? So, so currently these computers still make lots of errors. So we are basically, when we want to write a program to run on one of these quantum computers, it's very limited in, in depth. So for, Classical computers, we know we can write the program as long as we like to, and it just might take a long time, but there's no other problem than that. On a quantum computer, if you write the, computer, the program too long, the computer might have forgotten what we started with, right? So, so, so this is still like a big limitation of current day devices. And another problem is that when we read, read out the results, there are other errors that these machines make. And so it's not clear how, how all this will scale in the end. So what we are currently interested in, and this is now the, the mission that we are on, is to identify a subset of problems, to identify problems that are hard on classical computers. So where we just have this exponential scaling with system size, but they are doable on, on near-term devices. So we really have to adjust our thinking and adjust the way of, of, of attacking problems to how these devices work and what the limitations are of these devices, right? So let me be clear, if we had a perfect quantum computer, many of the problems that we are dealing with right now would probably be solved, but we don't have these machines yet. So, so let us now think what we can do with these far from being perfect machines. So, and here I want to discuss now two two different projects. The first is on symmetry protected topological phases. And what I want to discuss here 
is that how we can use, how we can study a topological phase transition, namely a phase transition from one topological phase to another topological phase um, via a um, quantum processor. And the second part, and um, I want to discuss how we can realize sort of intrinsically topologically ordered states, right? So these are the two different classes of topological phases that I want to, that I, that I mentioned earlier. So let me start discussing the, the first talk and let me for this be a bit more precise about the definition of, of phases of matter. So, and for what I'm discussing now, I want to limit myself on to gapped quantum phases. Uh, gapped means that I'm looking at systems where we have an energy gap above the, the ground state. And I'm looking at the physics at zero temperature. So, so the only fluctuations that, that we have are, are quantum fluctuations. So we completely neglect thermal fluctuations. And, and here I have now a very stringent definition of what I mean by a phase of matter. So I'm stating that two Hamiltonians, like Hamiltonian H0 and H1, are in the same phase if I can find a continuous path in parameter space connecting those two um, without closing the gap. Right? So as, as shown here, so we just interpolate between from, from one phase to the other and the gap never closes. If however, and this is now the second case, um, there is an avoid, unavoidable phase transition or an unavoidable gap closing or singularity, then I'm saying that H0 and H1 are in different phases. This sort of the technical definition is actually important because if, for example, you look at liquid water and vapor, naively, if you just boil water, you feel that, oh, these are clearly two different phases of matter because you just see that the water is boiling, there's a phase transition between it. But if you just increase pressure, there is actually an unavoidable, there is actually a, the, the, the phase transition is, is avoidable, right? So you can just heat it up under pressure and, and then you can just go from one to the other without going, undergoing a phase transition. Good, so much about the definition of, of these different gapped phases or gapped quantum phases of, of matter. In one dimension, the gapped phases are completely classified. What, what do I mean by this? I mean that you just give me the, the states that you have and you just tell me what kind of symmetries are in, in the game. And then I can tell you just by looking at the state, whether you can find a path or you cannot find a path, right? So I can ask, Sorry. yes? Is that for all systems or just spin systems? This is for all systems in 1D. Like all gapped local Hamiltonians can be classified. Okay, even fermions and bose hubbard these sorts of things. Yes. Well, if you ask a theoretical physicist, yes. If you ask a mathematician, maybe there are some loopholes, but with these constraints, yes. Well, and maybe could you could you uh, define the word classify? That that might also help. Uh, well, I mean, the way that I'm uh, what I mean by classify is that you just give me a state, you give me two states, and you just tell me what are the symmetries that you want to keep. Now I just do certain measurements on these states. I just define some invariant topological invariants or order parameter, and then I can tell if you actually can find a path, yes or no. Does this answer your question? Yeah, I, I think so. The, the reason I, I brought this up is because often classification is viewed a bit more narrowly, which is that you compute some group cohomology and you know that there are, let's say, 16 states of matter. And maybe you have an example of two others. But this is the same, but I think in, in my view, this is the same thing, right? So I can tell you basically how many labels there are, right? So for example, if you, if you if you take if you say that this is a fermionic system without any symmetry except fermion parity symmetry, then I can tell you that there are two different phases, and I know exactly what to look for. Right. So in that simple example, I agree. Yes, but there are some examples where the number is more sixteen thirty two, mm -hmm. and it's not clear if one could actually identify thirty two different Hamiltonians, uh, and yes. pinpoint this one falls here, this one falls there, especially in higher dimensions. Let's get 
This oh, no, I'm talking only about 1D. In, in higher dimension, I agree it's not obvious, but in, in 1D, it's clear because if, I mean, the, the underlying idea is that every state can be, every gapped state can be represented in terms of an MPS. And for every MPS, I can just write down a parent Hamiltonian to which this is the, the ground state. Good. And let me just actually just give two specific examples. So the different ways we can have different phases is like one is we have kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So and here the kind of most prominent example is the transverse field Ising model. The Ising model has a Z2 symmetry from globally flipping all spins up or down. And the Hamiltonian is, is, is given here. So we have an Ising, uh, like a ferromagnetic Ising term between neighboring spins, and we have a transverse field term. And if we just consider only the, uh, if we only consider the Ising term, then the ground state is a spontaneously broken term. So either I, all spins would point up or down. So that state at zero temperature breaks the Z2 symmetry. And if you take the other extreme where G would go to infinity, in that case, we find that the spins are polarized pointing all in the same direction. And uh, that is a ground state that's symmetric. So now we can just use the Landau theory of phase transitions. And we just know that there has to be a phase transition between these two. And for this exactly solvable model, we know that this happens exactly at G equals two to one. And we can distinguish those two phases by calculating a local order parameter. Particularly, we can calculate the correlation function between sigma z and sigma z. And that is finite in the spontaneous symmetry broken phase, and it's zero in the symmetric phase. Good. So this is the one way how we can distinguish um, two different quantum phases in 1D just by identifying the symmetry and then seeing how the symmetries are broken in different phases. The other way how we can distinguish phases is in terms of so-called symmetry protected topological phases. And again, I want to demonstrate this by a very simple example. So we have here the cluster state Hamiltonian and the transverse field again, like the same as what we had before. In the limit of large G, the ground state again is just a simple polarized state, which is symmetric. And if I look at the ground state of this cluster term here, it's also a symmetric state. So, so the ground state uh, also has the full Z2 cross Z2 symmetry, so it's like a, a larger symmetry than the Ising model. But now we have a phase transition between two phases that are both symmetric. So the ground state doesn't break any of the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. And in this case, the two different phases can be classified also, and in this case, by so-called symmetry fractionalization. So we just look at for example, in, in, at a finite chain. And we see that in one of those two phases, we have a fractionalized degree of freedom at the edge, and the other one, we, we don't. I, I don't want to get into the details how this is done, but there's a very general framework that allows us to distinguish those two different phases in terms of this concept of symmetry fractionalization. And as a direct consequence of this, we actually have also an order parameter which in this case is a non-local order parameter, right? Just recall previously, like for the Ising phase, we just look at a ZZ correlation. And here we calculate the expectation value of a string of operators. And in particular, if we calculate the expectation value of a string operator, where we just apply Sigma X to a number of uh, contiguous spins, we see that this, is, this expectation value is non-zero in one of the symmetric phases, and we can show that it has to be identically zero in the other phase. Right? So we have now a string order parameter that distinguishes those two phases. So this is basically all that can happen in these one dimensional systems. So either they spontaneously break the symmetry or symmetries fractionalize. And in both cases, we have order parameters. In the one case, a local order parameter, and the other case, these string order parameters to distinguish these phases. So now we are equipped with the theory behind it and we want to look at a phase diagram of a full model. And the model that we're looking at combines these terms now. Right? So we have the symmetry breaking term, we have the transverse field term, it's not the symmetry, so we have the Ising term, we have the transverse field term, and we have the cluster state term. And now we can look at the full 
phase diagram, and this is now plotted for this triangle. So you have a triangle where at the corners, we have just one term. Like so this left lower left corner, we have only the cluster term. On the right corner, lower corner, we have just a transverse field term. And the top corner, we only have this ferromagnetic Ising term. And then we see that we have now a model where we have a symmetry protected topological phase, we have a symmetry broken phase, and we have a trivial um, product state, um, like sorry, a trivial kind of paramagnetic phase. And this is now a nice toy model to study phase transitions between these different models. And this model has a very nice property because if we look along a path following this black parabola, it actually turns out that the ground state can be written exactly in terms of a very simple uh, bond dimension two MPS. Right? So this is now very nice. At these corners, we already know that there's a very simple state because this is like a sum of stabilizers and here is a, a just a, a product state, but actually it turns out in, along this entire path, we can just write down the wave function exactly as a very simple matrix product state. Frank, just to clarify, does the symmetry change going from orange to, to, to green? No, so we still have, we just keep, we, we keep, the, the symmetries. So what distinguishes the two phases is this um, non-local order parameter. Yes. There is nothing in terms of the symmetry. It's not like the symmetry gets lowered. Exactly, right? So, so th that's why this path is particularly interesting because we really have now a phase transition between two symmetric phases, right? So here's an SBT phase and here's what we call the trivial phase. And there's no, if you just, look at local observables, there's no way to distinguish those two. The only way that you can distinguish them is by calculating indeed these string order parameters. So, so what happens at the critical point where the three phases meet? Yes, so this point is what we'll call a quadratic touching point. So, so there's something very neat about this point because this, even like if it has to be cross this point, even at this point, even though it's a kind of critical point with the diverging correlation length, like the correlation length is actually infinite at this point, we can still express the state exactly in terms of an MPS. And what, what's happening is that the state here, the ground state is a, is a cat state. And this is a way how you get an infinite correlation length despite this being a, a matrix product state. If you were to move down just by some epsilon, right? So if you just move down from this point down one epsilon, then the state would immediately require an infinite bond dimension because it would be a, a critical state described by a CFT. But this is like a highly fine-tuned line. So, but at long this line, we can express the ground set exactly in terms of a small bond dimension MPS. Okay, thank you. And this is like, I haven't mentioned quantum computers for a while now, but now we're just getting back to these quantum computers. Because there's a very nice property that every state that you can write down as, a, as an MPS, you can directly convert to a program on a quantum computer. And here is the example for a very simple MPS of bond dimension two. For a bond dimension two MPS, the MPS can be directly written in terms of just a sequential application of those two side gates. So if you just have the spins, so we just start from a state where the spins are just polarized, and now we just apply this sequential, like we apply these um, two side unitaries sequentially, then this is like a computer program or a quantum computer program that once it, it finished, the it prepared exactly the entanglement that we that we have in the ground state of this Hamiltonian, right? So now without having to do variational um, optimization, we just can write down a program that produces the, the proper ground state. And in fact, each of these unitaries can be produced in a very simple manner on these quantum computers using the simple kind of controlled gates and local operators. Uh, local operators. 
This is uh, the first trick so that we have a small bond dimension MPS and we can just directly encode it on, a, uh, on, on the quantum computer. And then we are making use of another nice property that's well known to practitioners of in the field of matrix product states, namely that one can use, we can basically code a DMRG code in such a way that it directly works in the thermodynamic limit. And the key idea that we use is that we just have now this sequential application of gates. And when we want to calculate expectation values, all the unitaries coming from below automatically cancel each other. So, so, so here there's no finitized. So basically we just can directly work in a thermodynamic limit. And all we have to do is just to, to start at some point where we do a measurement and everything else is correctly coming from, from infinity. And at the top side, we are not as fortunate, but what we can basically do is we can just solve this fixed point equation, like similar to finding the dominant eigenvector of the transfer matrix. And this gives us slightly different unitaries that we can plug in here. So this is the green unitary, which is also just decomposed here in terms of elementary circuits. And then what we have now is we have now a quantum circuit that we can apply to a handful of qubits. And then on the qubits that we have, we can now do a measurement. And this is now a measurement with respect to a wave function that's defined in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, it's maybe a bit confusing. Let me just repeat it. Every matrix product state can be just decomposed into a sequential application of local circuits. This is trick number one. And trick number two is that we just use translation invariants of the system, and then we can contract everything coming from the top into these fixed point circuits. That's why we have like one green unitary here. And then we can directly measure locally with respect to a wave function defined in thermodynamic limit. So, so, so this is how we just make best use of the limited number of qubits that we have. And we get away with a fairly short program in terms of the, the depth. So, uh, Frank, uh, two questions. Does you want effectively encode the environment mm -hmm. in the SMT matrices if this was two dimensions tensors? Yes, so this is exactly encoding the these U matrices, this U1 matrix encodes the, the environment. That's exactly right. Gotcha. And in this case, because it's 1D, the, this environment dimension chi is, is effectively just one. So that makes it easier. I see. Exactly. So, so this environment will just grow with the size of the unitaries that we need for the sequential application of our mm -hmm. MPS. And, and he has a question purely in terms of nomenclature. Um, when people talk about finite depths quantum circuits, what is referred to as depths? The number of these gray boxes, which then, or, or, or how many? <laughs> okay, finite depth would, right. So, so, so now we have to be a bit careful because you see that the depth here increases with the number of of uh, of qubits right so if you think of this as being like a finite size circuit then the depth of the circuit scales with the number of of qubits right so it's like a, a sequential circuit but this state because it's an mps it can be represented in terms it can be decomposed in a finite depth local unitary circuit so finite depth is defined in a thermodynamic limit? Yes, actually what I said is not fully true, sorry. So that's right. So, so if we talk about a finite depth local unitary circuit, it's something where we just really have a finite depth. So for example, if we were to have some, some checkerboard pattern, if you think of a trotter decomposition of a Hamiltonian, and we would say that first we apply one layer of gates on A sites, which we are on A bonds, which we can do in parallel. And then we just apply one layer on B sides. That would be a finite depth local unitary circuit. And now we see that this one here, actually it grows with system size. If you just forget about this trick to, to, to define for infinite systems, but we would just do it for a finite system. Then we see that the depth would grow linearly in systems. And there's a big difference now, because if you had this finite depth circuit, you wouldn't be able to create entanglement between the first and the last qubit, right? In fact, if you just have a finite depth circuit, 
in terms of this brick wall as I just described, all you can do is just to entangle um, qubits within the light cone, which is really short for a finite depth. But using this sequential circuit, actually I can entangle the very first qubit with the very last qubit. And this is exactly what's happening at this funny critical point in between, because here we have a cat state, which is entangled throughout the entire system. Good. So I assume that there are a bunch of technical details that might not be completely clear, but the, the key idea is that for this specific path that we have, like this black parabola, we actually know exactly how to encode the ground state on a quantum computer, and we can do this in the thermodynamic limit. And then all we have to do is we can now play around and do measurements on these qubits that we have. And this is what we then did on, on the IBM machine. So we now use the machine with 20 qubits, but we only use a subset of those qubits. And then we just measure the string order on those uh, subset of, of qubits. And we see the black line. The black line is, is the exact value. And we see that indeed it's zero in one phase and it's non-zero in the other phase. So this is a string order that distinguishes those two SPT phases. And now we just measure it on the, on the device and we see that, well, we just do get the right tendency, but we also see that there's a lot of noise that we get from, and this noise is mostly from the readout error. What and, are the different L's? Can you describe what's going on? Say it again. What are the different L's? Can you describe what yes. those are? So, so what we are doing is that we, as I said, we measure the system. We, we, we are always working in the thermodynamic limit, but, we are now measuring the string order on L sites. And the actual string order parameter would be the one that we let L go to infinity, but now we're just measuring it over a number of sites which would be large compared to the correlation length. And, and the black line is now the exact solution. And we see that in principle, all of those lines should basically fall on top of each other, um, but they don't. And this is because as we just make the block larger, it's not converging better to it, but, but we see that it's going down exponentially. And this is because measuring the string orders is actually quite hard on these, these quantum computers because these are just correlations between many sites, but many in terms of five. But, but that really shows the limitation, right? So we just use a machine and we can only use a subset of those and we still get pretty noisy data. This is a depressive view. But the optimistic view is that we do see some signal on this machine. And while this is clearly easily doable on any classical computer and probably most smartwatches could do this calculation, but, but the hope is at this point that the quantum computers will scale more favorable than classical computers. And if, if there's not an exponential scaling and getting better readout errors, et cetera, so then this could at some point be much more efficient because if we are just applying these circuits, then for quantum computers, it might scale linearly just applying these kind of gates. But for classical computers, if we just make the, we apply these unitaries to more and more gates, then the complexity would scale exponentially with the depth of the circuit. So, so this is the hope how, how this, can at some point help us. At the moment, we are far from any supremacy about classical computers for this, but, but that's a hope where this might lead us. And in fact, in a, in a recent paper that we are, well, that we are about to, 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 to wrap up, is that this trick of having a path connecting different phases, we can actually now generalize to, to many different topological phases, in particular for the entire one-dimensional BD1 class, we now have a skeleton of uh, MPS path where we can write down the ground state exactly and then also implement it on quantum computers. Uh, Frank, mm -hmm. I, I don't understand why you talk about quantum supremacy with this MPS where you can calculate the exact solution. Are you talking about the, the uh, highly, highly interacting systems or, or it's actually hard to compute these states if you scale up the system size? Right, so let me just give you an example where, so we can 
right so 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 we have this direct way of converting an mpf to 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 these kind of circuits so now what we can imagine is that we have now a ground state of some hamiltonian or maybe the time evolution of some other state it might be a state that has a lot of entanglement but it might have a fairly simple structure in terms of these sequential circuits so then there might be states that might be impossible, even like for a one dimensional system, there might be states that are impossible to simulate on a classic computer because the one dimension would grow exponentially, for example, in time. But they might be representable in terms of these sequential circuits. So what we could do is, and actually together with Andrew, we wrote another paper that I'm not mentioning here. But instead of having exactly known states, we can also in this space basically do a DMRG or quantum DMRG version where we just use this ansatz, and then we could just represent a class of states that would have a lot of entanglement, but relatively low complexity. And, and, and there we could get some supremacy compared to classical computers, even for one dimension systems. I see. Thanks. And maybe just one curiosity, if you could entangle spin one and spin n, mm -hmm. instead of measuring, would, would that also make the trick or you have to measure for some reason that so like Here, i don't have to measure oh I, I thought that you were like that those two red blocks uh where that you were measuring no 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 measuring. these are just inert i mean like I, I don't do measurements here it's all unitary i just don't i i just cannot use this qubit here um for for measurement so these are just i just leave them dangling around so ah okay So, um, so I want to ask if you, so on top of this circuits, mm -hmm. um, is it possible to add some finite depth circuit that doesn't scale with um, your um, system size mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, it can take the ground state to um, the other ground states in the phase diagram that- you know, Exactly. This is. Yeah. exactly true so if we just take this parabola we have just this kind of fine-tuned path and now as you say that well we want to go slightly like like say we are staying within this gapped phase and we want to just find a good approximation of the ground state nearby we can just use this as a starting point and then have a finite depth layer that we could optimize to use it as a starting point for for nearby hamiltonians yes I, see. I think this was the question, right? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And that and works even if you're nearby Hamiltonians or across the phase transition? No, well, I said we want to stay in this gapped phase, right? So the moment that we would, as I, as I said, pointed out earlier on, like if we had this specific critical point and we use some epsilon away from here, we would immediately have a state where where we don't have a finite depth representation of the of the grounds. And I, I wanted to probe you on this last uh, question. Maybe I just misunderstood what you just said. Um, I was under the impression, perhaps false, that any gap system in one D cannot have long range entanglement, in the sense of mm -hmm. fractionalization and having truly long range entanglement. Mm -hmm. and I that was the premise for why DMRG works so well in one plus one D is because you're essentially seeking, uh, if you wish, optimizing the matrix product states mm -hmm. in this multidimensional space based on the requirement of the least entanglement, right? And mm -hmm. reading like review articles by Scholl, work on others, there is a statement that any gapped system in one D can be mm -hmm. captured by a finite value of bond dimension. Yes. Right? In contrast to um, gapless states, Mm -hmm. where the D, the bond dimension you need, can in principle grow as a log of a system size. Or right? as a power law, as, as, in, as a, a, a algebraically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. But, but so, so this seems to suggest that, are you making the statement that actually there are SPT phases of matter that cannot be solved with a finite bond dimension DMRG on even on a, right, in thermodynamic limit. Somehow they have this intrinsic long range entanglement across the entire chain. Wait, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I think I never made this. Wait, 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 wait. So, so the thing is the following. If you have, if you take a cat state, 
like if you just for example take the ground state like like right take a take a finite system mm -hmm. and put yourself into the symmetry broken state okay in this case the ground state would be like morally speaking like all spins up plus all spins down mm -hmm. and that is a cat state that has long range entanglement because if you if you look at the entanglement like in this state the very first spin will be perfectly entangled with the very last spin because if you would do a measurement on the first spin you measure an up spin the wave function would collapse on the all up spins and that affects all spins in a system mm -hmm. so there are cat states and and these cat states do have non local entanglement and it maybe i mean just in terms of the notation so the, the, there's maybe a difference between this non local entanglement and and this kind of criticality that you were describing right so because these states that have non local entanglement can be perfectly well represented using finite depth circuits as the one that i'm showing here mm -hmm. Like this is like a bond dimension two MPS, and this can represent a state that has really non-local entanglement. Right? Because as I said, in a cat state, every spin is entangled with every other spin. I see. And that I state see. could not be represented by a finite depth local unitary circuit. I see. I see. Yeah, my, my impression is that the people who use this phrase long range entanglement, like Zhao Gang Win, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that they use it. You know in a different sense than just meaning there's long range entanglement between two spins right they i think they when they say long range entanglement i think they mean entanglement that can't be captured by a finite depth local unitary no no it, this one cannot this thing I, in, in in this type of entanglement of a cat state is generally the same thing as what you find in, in topological order it's if you have a, a product state you cannot convert a product state into a cat state by a finite depth local unitary circuit and yet it's a pure state, right? So if I were, if I took a cat state and did the bipartition of the system and computed for Neumann entropy, are you saying that would be infinite? No, it would be log two. Right, exactly. So, so in that sense, it's a very low entangled state. Well, the same is true for um, for a toric code ground state. Right? If you take a, a toric code ground state, this is exactly if you just you just have the area law mm -hmm. entanglement plus. Some some constant. This constant is the same log two that you get in these cat states. I see. I see. Well, so I, in I this way, this is exactly the same notion. You, you just say that this kind of catness of a state you cannot remove or produce by a finite depth unitary circuit, but you can do it using these sequential circuits. Mm -hmm. Thanks. When you say finite depth unitary circuit, uh, you mean something different from from this sequential. I mean, for for me, this is also a sequential. This sequential thing is also finite depth. No, no, no. It's, circuit, this so is it. not finite depth because the oh, it scales with n. That's what exactly, you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. So ah, okay, okay. Right. So the depth is really like the how how deep this circuit is, like in, in this direction. I see. And, and, and the depth scales with n. So this would be I called see. like a linear depth yeah. circuit. So in, intuitively, to, to, cre to create n body entanglement, you need to do at least n operations. That's mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. Yes. Good. What's not good is I'm not really sticking to my schedule. So, but I, I will be a bit faster on the second talk, not to for you, but, but I'm done with the first part now. So, so here we just discussed some ideas how we can cross a topological, like a symmetry protected topological phase transition in these 1D systems. And, and now I will just speed up a bit and just kind of give you an idea about what we did in 2D. And then we have some time for discussions if you want to know something in, in more detail. So let me now, first briefly just discuss what we mean by topological order and these topological order systems are systems that are mainly characterized by the emergence of fractionalized excitations that have so-called anionic statistics right so they're different from bosons and fermions and a necessary condition for having this non-low by having these exotic anionic quasiparticle is 
it is what we also just discussed in a moment, like this non-local entanglement in the wave function. Right? We can just think that if we have two of these anions, we can put one on Mars, the other one on Earth, and we just exchange them. Those never have to get close, but this quantum state senses that we just exchange them in a certain way. And this is carried by this non-local entanglement that we have in the wave function. And a direct consequence of having this is this additive constant that we, that we add to the area law and entanglement. And this gives us some hint about having a topological order, but the but the um, but this doesn't give us a very concrete or not, not a very complete classification. In order to figure out what kind of topological phase we have, we need to be more specific and look at the exchange and mutual statistics of all the possible types of excitations that we can have in a system. And from that, we believe that we have a pretty complete understanding of. Um, a, of what kind of topological order we are dealing with, even though no complete classification exists in, in the mathematical sense. Good. And as a concrete example, I'm introducing here the toric code model. It's, it's, it's a simple spin model where we have spins living on the bonds of the lattice, as shown here. And we have two terms, a term in, in Z operators living on the vertices or the, on the stars, and we have a plaquette term like a, um, living on, on these plaquettes, and this is like an X term. And doing some algebra, we find that these terms commute and it's exactly solvable. And if we just use this notation where we say that an upspin correspond to an empty bond and a downspin correspond to putting a red bar on or like a, a loop segment onto, a, onto, onto that bond, then the ground state of this Hamiltonian is a state which is simply like an equal-weighted superposition of all those configurations that correspond to closed loops, right? So this is one, and you can think of uh, many other ways how we can put closed loop on a lattice. And if you just superimpose all of them, that's the ground state of this Hamiltonian. So now we're just following a strategy which is very similar to what we did before, because now we can think about a simple program that produces this ground state on the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. and, and this is shown here, and just to, because we're gonna see these pictures quite a bit. So we just take here the Tory code lattice as before. So this is a black lattice. And we have the spin degrees of freedom here, the qubits that live on the bonds. And now we just have a program and that works the following way. We just apply Hadamard gates to a subset of those qubits. And then we apply sequentially, starting from the middle to the outside, um, C naught operations. And once we are done, we actually get the ground state. And this shows up in this color coding because the blue squares, they are the squares that live on, on the vertices, as shown here, right? So, and, and those are blue, meaning that. The stabilizer measures here um, a one, so, so, so all of them are in the plus one state, and the purple ones are the plaquettes, and all of them are in the plus one state with respect to uh, the product of these axes. So that's now a perfectly the ground state of our Tory code Hamiltonian. This is a schematic, and now we can just apply this or like run this on, on the Google quantum computer, this program, and then do the measurement of the energy. So we just measure the stabilizes on the plaquettes and the vertices, and we get then an average stabilizer fidelity of, of more than 90%, which is pretty good compared to what, we, what we've seen before for these string orders, right? So we just get a pretty good fidelity. So this is a pretty good realization of the, of the ground state. Is that really the fidelity or just the mean expectation or average of the expectation value here? Uh, th this is the expectation values of those stabilizers. Okay. So, and now we can just look at this quantity that I just introduced, this topological entanglement entropy, gamma, and there's a neat trick to extract this, with respect to Kitaev and Preskill, that you just 
calculate the entanglement for different partitions and you subtract and add them such that all the local contributions cancel and we are left with this additive topological entanglement entropy. And now we can just put different partitions onto the chip. And since I want to be fast, I mean, I just show the result here. So, so this is now a histogram shown for measurements of the topological entanglement entropy for different partitions shifted around on, on the chip. And we see that it's pretty close to the expected value of minus log two, um, which is some noise because of many um, um, the readout errors, but it's, it's pretty close to, to what we expect. And, and this has made me quite happy because it shows that the ground state actually contains this topological entanglement as non-local entanglement as, as it uh, as it's supposed to, right? So we just really get the proper entanglement structure into the, the ground state after running our program. Now, the second bit that I mentioned is that if we want to characterize the topological order, what we actually have to do is we have to do measure the exchange statistics, which is commonly encoded in a diagonal U matrix, right? Just exchanging any on A and any on A. And the mutual statistics, which is like uh, usually encoded in the S matrix, which just encodes the elements of the S matrix encode what happens if we just move an A particle around a B particle. Right? So exchange statistics we know from bosons and fermions. Mutual statistics is always trivial for bosons and fermions. And this is something specific to anions. So now we can measure it on, on the device by actually dragging these excitations around each other, right? So the cool thing is that for this Tori code model, we know exactly how this adiabatic transport would work because it just works by applying sequentially sigma x and sigma z operators, right? So we can just move around particles fairly easily. And the way that we can then measure the phase that we pick up is by using this sort of Ramsey interferometry. And what we do is we just add one extra qubit to, to our system, the one here in the, the top corner. And we just prepare a state, which is zero times the ground state plus one times the ground state. And then to this superposition of those states, like to, the, to this state that we now created, we apply a control U operation, which means that in one copy, two particles are actually exchanged. And in the other copy, the two particles are just left where they were. And then we can measure the overlap. And, and from this overlap, we then can extract the phase that we picked up after this adiabatic transport around um, each other. And then we can just read off the, the phase. And, and this is now shown here. And instead of discussing all the parts, let me just discuss some of them. So we have now the exchange statistics is, for example, if we exchange and electric particle with another electric particle. So these are defects of the vertices. We just pick up a phase of plus one. If we exchange two magnetic particles, so these are excitations on the plaquettes, we get a phase of plus one. And if we just take a bound state of an electric and then a magnetic particle together, we get a phase of minus one. And these are actually supposed to be fermions, like emergent fermions in our um, spin model. And uh, that comes out pretty, pretty neatly. And, and the same we just can do for the element of the S matrix, just to drag around some anion A around another anion B. Is there an analogous thing one could do if you had non-abelian anions? Because it seems like this is the Ramsey interferometry seems based on the idea that when you that whatever you're doing to your state phi, you end up with e to the i theta times phi at the end. Yes. And if you had non-abelian anions, I mean, I know, I know there's no trivial. Very good involved. question. And this is a very relevant question because as I'm going to point out in a moment, we, for, we have generalized, um, oops, sorry. Um, what we do? Yeah, right. So, so that we actually now actually have circuits, we have programs for all sorts of uh, non-abelian string net models. And we also know how to do braiding but we, well, at least I haven't thought about how to use this Ramsey interferometry 
in that case. So, so that I just simply haven't thought about. But, but that's actually a very relevant and interesting question because we know how to do all this non-abelian braiding, but we, I, I haven't thought about how to do this with Ramsey interferometry. So. Good so I also have a question about that plot, which is those errors don't look statistical. They look like all the phases are systematically shifted in one direction. Do we know why it looks like that? I don't. I think that this must be a, I, mean, I, I don't see a systematic reason for this being shifted to the left as opposed to, to the right. No, I mean, good. Good point again. I, I uh, th this I don't know. I mean, there is actually one one thing which I am not showing here, but that's also remarkable because the the the, the readout of the phases is at least I think extremely good, and this is actually much better than the amplitude. So if we just plot the result on a Bloch sphere, we see that we just get the direction pretty accurately. But we're just kind of moving really inside of the block sphere. So the so we just get more amplitude errors and phase errors. And that's specific to the machine. So if the machine was constructed in a different way, maybe amplitudes would be better, but the phases would be worse. But for this specific machine, the the phase error is extremely small. And and this also in since we're talking about this more technical thing, I mean, this is also one thing that I learned from these kind of two projects. The first one we just did mostly by ourselves, just running the IBM machine via the cloud access. And, and we already saw that there's lots of noise, right? Even on day to days, like doing the same experiment or measurement on a Monday as compared to doing it on a Tuesday might make a big difference. And, but there we just didn't really have our handle on all the details. But for Google, Kevin, who, who did all these ran these kind of codes, he he knew exactly how to get the best out of these machines and that made a made a very big difference. Good. So let me then come come to, to the conclusion. So let me before I conclude actually I'm briefly thank all my collaborators. So Leo who is a student who started not too long ago and he 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 did uh, most of the work for the for, for figuring out the different circuits. Uh, Adam Smith, who was a postdoc in my group, my colleague Michael Knapp, uh, Christina Knapp um, from from Microsoft, uh, Kevin and Pedram, who ran the experiments on the Google machine, and uh, Andrew and Bernard, with whom we did the SPT work. So let me now um, conclude and, and thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, uh, Frank, um, for answering all the questions that were posed during the talk. And, and uh, yeah, so this is great. Um, well, the floor is open for questions. Um, anybody who'd like to ask? So I'm, I'm just a little curious since you left it open on the last slide. So what is the simplest non-abelian string net model that you, you can explore, that you are exploring? But yeah, we look at a Fibonacci model. So, 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 so we have general frameworks to to do all string nets, but the simplest one that we did in detail is this uh, is the Fibonacci model, because we are actually curious about. Right, we think it's neat to 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 emulate or to simulate this this non-abelian braiding. Um, and Frank, related to um, so in the first part, you had a very concrete Hamiltonian that you wanted to simulate, correct? Mm -hmm. In the second part, I'm not even sure how to write down a, uh, this could be my ignorance, how to write down the parent Hamiltonian for the Fibonacci model, right? Is it what, is it also some of commuting projectors? Is it something yeah. more? Complex? Yeah, so you can, it's actually following the same spirit basically. So for the, for the Tory code model, mm -hmm. I mean, but I, I, the, the bit more abstract ways that you can think of that the, that the ground state imposes like all the other or the braiding or sorry um, or the fusion of, of, of the anions and then you can just generalize this to, to more exotic you can take the f symbols describing a topological order and then you can construct the state and 
you can construct a stabilizer Hamiltonian to which this sends a ground state. So, so the Hamiltonians look all the same. You have just these kind of plaquette and star terms, and they're all commuting. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if I look sort of in the beginning of the second part of the talk where you showed how you actually realized the Kitaev model, right, if I understood correctly, mm -hmm. it's not that you're explicitly starting from the Hamiltonian. I mean, it's implicit. Yeah. But if I look at this picture over here, right, it mm -hmm. seems that what you're rather trying to do is to pre precisely have a wave function in the form as written in the top line. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that sort of simulates the string neck net condensation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess what I'm asking is that, well, when it comes to non-abelian or other more complicated anionic phases, is it the same idea? Yes. You have a vision of what it should look like in terms of string nets? And yes. From this perspective, what exactly the Hamiltonian looks like, how, was it has two, three, five mutually commuting terms, is less important, mm -hmm. as long as you have some guiding principle for what kind of wave function you want to get in the end. Mm -hmm. right? right. Yeah, let me also maybe elaborate on this point, because uh, um, so, so, so the question like might might again be like why why are we actually interested in that, uh, and the reason where I think that this could be useful is now the following. So in in certain cases we just do know exactly how to construct wave functions. So like another example might be the the Laughlin wave function. So we just know exactly how to construct the, the state, but yet doing measurements is still not easy, right? and and. Certain cases we just get away with doing Monte Carlo, but in others we, we might not. So, and, and, and this is where I see the strengths of this approach, right? So that we might have interesting ground states, or as I showed in the first case, even like families of, of, of states that we can simulate or that we can encode on the quantum computer, and then we can do measurements on these wave functions. And, and there are cases where we just wouldn't know how to do this efficiently on a quantum computer, but we can run it on a quantum computer. And with this example on this Tori code, we had a still this like 31 qubits is still doable on a on a classical computer, but that's already more challenging. Right? So it's that wouldn't run on a common smartwatch. So so here we just really would already need a larger computer. And and then again the hope is that these machines do scale more favorably than 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 the than the clusters that we have. Can I ask a, a, a short question on the um, on the SPT phase on the uh, the Hamiltonian that you had that was like a three body Hamiltonian? So that remind mm -hmm. me that you can find similar Hamiltonian in the quantum link model for high energy physics, mm -hmm. uh, like where you where you basically one spin mediate. So I wonder I wonder if there is a connection between uh, this SPT and and having, you know, a, a Gauss law or some gauge invariant. Um, it's not a, it's up to a rotation is exactly the same Hamiltonian where it's like sigma x, sigma z, sigma x mm -hmm. on three different sides. Um, can, you, can you say it again? What, what's the Hamiltonian exactly? Sigma z? It would be x, i, x, i plus uh, z, i plus one, uh, x i plus two, and basically the 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 z would be the 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 site would be the mm -hmm. site in the middle would be the link would be I mean it's it's a very rough approximation because in principle it should be like an infinite state but you have only two states mm -hmm. um, and then the two the two uh, sites in between are are the uh, the matter sites basically mm -hmm. right I mean there, then there would be right the moment that you have this Hamiltonian, then mm -hmm. you then you need. Let me just. What I'm telling you now is like a bit bit simplified version of what I was what, what I'm actually using. But as I point out, we have this Z two cross Z two symmetry, and what is this Z two cross Z two symmetry? This symmetry you can think of the following way: we just take the spins and enumerate them by even and odd. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And now you can define an operation which is the product of all sigma x on the even sides or all the products of the sigma x's on odd sides. These are two symmetry operations. Both of them are Z2 symmetries. And the Hamiltonian commutes with both of them, right? So 
the IV model only has a Z symmetry because I have a product of all sigma x's. The Hamiltonian commutes with that. But this, oops, sorry. I see. There you this can. This Hamiltonian has this higher and symmetry, and and if you and now you can just check your quantum link Hamiltonian, and you can check does it have these kind of symmetries, and if it does, it might be actually in a in a in an SPT phase. I see. Mm -hmm. So the two z two are flipping all the odds and all the and all the even. exactly exactly. So so you have like right now this kind of lattice. You have like the even and the odd sides, mm -hmm. and this kind of gives you the z two cross z two symmetry, and that symmetry stabilizes the SPT phase. Okay. This is a dihedral group or d two h, and that one stabilizes is necessary to have this distinction between those two phases and this is because we know that this kind of string order distinguishes those two phases and if you have a quantum link model which has a similar symmetry it's it might or might not be in in this kind of spt phase so and as a result if you if you are in one phase you just would know that it has edge modes if you just consider it with open boundary conditions and, and so on and so forth mm -hmm. i see okay thanks Frank, could I ask you to go one slide back for the transverse field Ising model, which mm -hmm. sort of we're all familiar with. So if you look, um, I wanted to ask you a question about the cat states, the Schrodinger cat states. Yeah. If I look at the symmetry broken phase on the left, one could argue that, you know, it's an Ising state, so they could all point up, they could all point down. And since those two states are degenerate, you could legitimately ask, well, can I have alpha spin up plus beta spin down with some arbitrary coefficient alpha beta? Yes. And in, in principle, the answer is yes, you can have such cat states. They would be also example of spontaneous symmetry broken states. Mm -hmm. The reason why often they're not um, realized is because the argument is they're often they're infinitesimally sensitive to yes. noise. If you add a local source of noise, it would tend to project on either up, 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 up or yes. down, down, right? And from this perspective, I, I would like to maybe come back to this question. Okay, so if we can easily disentangle the cat states in the way which you just said to just purely spontaneous symmetry broken, does it that mean that all kind of gapped states that you could study in 1D fall in one of the two categories? They're either symmetry broken, like cat state would be an example of, mm -hmm. or they could be described by a MPS with a finite value of D, right? That, that is, does not depend on the system size. Wait, wait, wait. So, so we have to be careful. Um, the if you represent a cat state in terms of an MPS, the bond dimension of the MPS does not scale with system size, right? So, there we have to be a bit careful about the notion. So, this sequential circuit that I'm drawing here, it's not a finite depth local unitary circuit, but it is a bond dimension two MPS. Putting it differently, not every MPS mm -hmm. is a finite depth, can be described in terms of a finite depth local unitary circuit. However, every finite depth local unitary circuit can be represented as a finite dimensional MPS. I see. So that then resolves the, the sort of the, the conceptual issue I had as to representability of a state in one plus one D gap states mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. MPS. So I think you would agree then with the statement I made earlier, which was borrowed from Sherlock, is that any gapped state in 1D mm -hmm. can be represented by MPS with a finite bond dimension D. Yes, so there are some proofs by, by Hastings. Exactly, so, so you're not disputing that. What you're saying, however, is that there are subsets of this MPS mm -hmm. that furthermore cannot be represented as a finite depth quantum circuit. That's right. I see, okay. And this is exactly for this reason that the MPS of this kind of form, you can just, like, it's very easy to write down a cat state MPS. Mm -hmm. right? This is a state which just, like, just makes sure that every, like the spin of every spin, like if you have a spin up, the next spin is up, the next spin is up. Exactly. Exactly. So you just kind of set it in the beginning and, or if you set the first, if, if mm -hmm. it's been down, the next spin has to be down, the next spin has to be down. It's a it's a very simple to write down MPS, and that would then uh, have 
this long, long range entanglement. So it cannot be representative of the finite depth local unitary set. Wonderful. So, Any other questions to Frank? Yeah, go on. Yeah, can I, uh, so, so I wonder if there is any um, the theorem telling us what is the, the lower bound of the circuit depths that we need to, for example, make a topological order state. Since um, we know it's can, it cannot be finite depth. Uh, so what, what you showed is that it scale with the linear size. Yes. Uh, so I, I want, yeah, I wonder if there is any um, theorem about the lower bound that you can reach. Parametrically, linear is the lowest you can get. Okay. Because the way that you can think about it is that you have to zip through the lattice, right? So you just have uh, you 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 want to create this sort of long range entanglement, and the only way that you can get it is by yeah zipping through the system. Okay, I see. Okay, thanks. But the coefficient makes, if this is actually, when the, the reason that I started this project was because I had some idea how to, I had some idea for a circuit, which also was scaling linear. And then I thought, okay, this is maybe useful for quantum computers. But then that, then Leo was working on it and he just figured out a circuit that also has linear scaling, but it's much lower coefficient. It just by this kind of sequential application of these Hadamas. And, and then at this point also, one has to already include a lot of knowledge about the quantum processor. Because when we started this co uh, collaboration with Google, they told us that, OK, that they are much better in applying uh, control not instead of control Z. They are, are able to apply gates in parallel if they are on disjoint qubits, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of things which I think are quite specific for a given machine and then it then one has to basically tailor the the circuits to optimize it for a given machine so it's an it's an opposite from the universal quantum machine <laughs> it's very non-universal <laughs> well in terms of the gate set it's universal but uh, it comes with lots of strings attached <laughs> like, no, 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 this, this was pun intended uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, at this point, if there are no other questions, um, it's getting late, uh, Frank's time. Frank, thank you so much for, for making this possible. I know it's past eight o'clock your time and, and you know, um, so I promise that next time you come to Rice, we'll definitely take you out for dinner. <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you. And thanks for all the, the, um, the questions. That were very, very, very nice. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Nice to see you again. <laughs> nice to see you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.